high stakes primary. Indiana voters play an important role in choosing presidential nominees. This man is a pathological liar. Republican Ted Cruz launches a blistering attack on rival screaming. Donald Trump. More violence in Aleppo, Syria. A dozen more people die as the number of Christians there dwindles. And Blue Mass, praying for first responders while remembering those who have fallen. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, May 3rd, 2016. Good evening, thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. Indiana is in the political spotlight tonight. Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, Hillary Clinton, and Bernie Sanders all made last ditch efforts for votes today. Chief White House correspondent and political director Lauren Ashburn reports. This Indiana primary is seen as make or break for Ted Cruz, who today blasted Donald Trump's faith. The voters could decide whether or not Trump can grab the nomination outright. During this unusual campaign season, candidates are fighting for every vote. Ted Cruz appeared with Indiana's governor, who offered his endorsement. My choice uh, in the Indiana primary is Ted Cruz. But Cruz is polling a distant second. Donald Trump has a double-digit lead, but he's still leaning hard on Cruz. I think he's crazy. I, honestly, I think he's crazy. Trump is keeping Hillary Clinton in his sights as well. I would say that she started screaming at the teleprompter, but I'm not allowed to say that. She's also taking heat from Bernie Sanders. On Monday, he insisted he is the only one who can win in November and accused her of corruption. When we talk about a rigged system, it's also important to understand how the Democratic convention works. But Clinton is increasingly turning her focus to the general election. She spent part of Monday talking to coal miners. I know people think, OK, you come, you talk to us, you ask for our votes, and what do you do? You never produce. So I'm trying to say, look, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do so you can hold me accountable. There are 57 Republican delegates available, and Trump and Cruz aren't pulling any punches. Jason Calvi joins us with more on the figurative fisticuffs. Lauren, it's Cruz's last stand, a climax to a rowdy primary season, one of the last chances to stop Donald Trump from getting the Republican nomination, and Cruz came out swinging. This man is a pathological liar. Senator Ted Cruz's blistering attack on the GOP frontrunner. Morality does not exist for him. Donald Trump fires back, saying it is no surprise he has resorted to his usual tactics of over-the-top rhetoric that nobody believes. Lion Ted does not have the temperament to be doing this. He is choking like a dog because he's losing so badly. We have to put him away tomorrow. Even though leading evangelicals like Jerry Falwell Jr. support Trump, Cruz blasted Trump's faith on the Glenn Beck program today. Prayer is for the weak. He views prayer as a sign of weakness. Cruz has spent the past week in the Hoosier state. We are staring at the abyss, and I have incredible faith. In Hoosiers. And Trump has visited Indiana many times. Indiana is very important because if I win, that's the end of it. It comes down to voters, like this Trump supporter. I was a vet, and I'm tired of all these career politicians just saying what people want to hear. Earlier today, Trump rehashed allegations first reported by the National Enquirer that Cruz's father was in a 1963 photo with Lee Harvey Oswald. Cruz called it nuts and kooky. He responded with this message for Indiana. The entire country is depending on you. The entire country is looking to you right now. It is only Indiana that can pull us back. The Real Clear Politics average of pre-election polls put Trump up nearly 11 points. A Cruz campaign aide says they've been told to prepare for a very somber speech tonight in Indy. We'll have results and analysis tomorrow. Meanwhile, other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. Today is National Teacher Appreciation Day. In Detroit, public school teachers who say they would appreciate a paycheck call in sick again to make their point. Detroit teachers were expected to return to work today, but they were also expecting to be paid. We need our money. Nobody works for free. Instead, for a second straight day, more than 1,500 public school educators called in sick. That forced all but three Detroit public schools to close again. 
Teachers are holding out for a guarantee from the school district that they'll be paid come July 1st. That's when the district will run out of money, unable to write paychecks for hours teachers have already worked. It's the legislator's job to do the right thing and to make sure people are paid appropriate. The district is depending on Michigan state lawmakers to pass a $715 million reform bill. It would pay down the district's massive debt and keep teachers' paychecks from bouncing. Until then, there are no guarantees. The bill has passed the state Senate and is backed by the governor. It still needs approval from the House. Michigan Speaker Kevin Cotter called teachers egotistical, saying their selfish and misguided plea for attention only makes it harder for us to enact a rescue plan. Meanwhile, students are caught in the middle. School closures are forcing more than 45,000 students to stay home and their parents to scramble. They need their money, but at the same token, parents like me, we still have to figure out what to do at the last minute. All of this on National Teacher Appreciation Day. Meanwhile, Michigan's governor meets tomorrow in Flint with President Obama to discuss that city's water crisis. Republican Governor Rick Snyder will likely seek more federal help from the administration. Snyder blames state regulators in part for Flint's contaminated water. He also points to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Flint used improperly treated river water for 18 months, allowing lead to leach from old pipes and fixtures. New violence in Syria kills more than a dozen people. Opposition fighters shelled parts of Aleppo. This video shows widespread damage to buildings there. The government's army claims it's repelling a rebel offensive against Syria's largest city. The diplomatic focus now moves to Moscow, where talks are underway to restore a ceasefire that would include Aleppo. More than 250 civilians have died in that contested city over the past 12 days. Ed Penton is Rome correspondent for EWTN's National Catholic Register. Ed, the U.N. says Aleppo is on the brink of catastrophe. What can you tell us about the Christians there? Yes, uh, the situation in Aleppo, as we understand it, is really serious. Um, it's, uh, it's got a great Christian patrimony. It's the second, I think it's the largest number of, of Christians in Syria live in, in Aleppo. Um, and uh, as far as we understand, it's experiencing, as, as, as Bishop Aldo said of Aleppo, uh, the loss of a church and the loss of Christian tradition there. Uh, so it's a very situation, a serious situation going on there, and a very uh, a big humanitarian crisis taking place. Tell us about the persecuted Christians being remembered in a special way in Rome last week, Ed. Yes, well, Aleppo was uh, central to that as well because Bishop Aldo spoke of that. It was uh, the, the whole of Trevi Fountain. It's a very famous landmark in Rome. Was lit up red uh, to remember and honor uh, Christian martyrs, persecuted Christian martyrs. Um, and it was really a very special way of bringing this issue out into the secular world and, and making them aware, making those, those outside the church, if you like, aware of this very serious situation. Uh, there's something like 200 million persecuted Christians around the world, many of whom are martyred. So it's a very timely time to, uh, to have this uh, special event last week. Besides Bishop Auda, who else was there and what was accomplished in this show of support? Yeah, there was a, a good variety of people who've been affected personally by, by Christian persecution. Uh, there was the, the brother of, uh, uh, sorry, a friend of, of, Paul, uh, of Shabazz Bhatti, who was gunned down in Pakistan uh, as he was a minister of religious affairs. That was a few years ago. There was also the, the sister of Don, uh, Don Andreas Santoro, who was a, a priest in Turkey, who was, who was killed 10 years ago. And there was also uh, a Missionaries of Charity sister there uh, who knew uh, the four Missionaries of Charity sisters who were killed uh, in Yemen just a few months ago. So it had a good variety of people there who could give real testimony to, to the suffering of, Christian, of persecuted Christians. And it was held by the Aid to the Church in Need, which is, um, which is obviously helping uh, persecuted Christians around the world. So it was, uh, it was a well-attended event as well, a large crowd there. All right, the National Catholic Register's Ed Penton joining us from Rome. Thank you, Ed. Thanks, Brian. Meanwhile, a group of Syrian refugees arrives in Rome. They come as part of an effort to establish a safe and legal humanitarian corridor to Europe. The project is run by a Catholic group and the Federation of Evangelical Churches in Italy. This is the third group arriving in Italy since the project began. About 500 refugees are to be resettled from Lebanon. An American Navy SEAL is killed in Iraq by ISIS gunfire. The SEAL died today during an attack on Iraqi Kurdish positions outside the ISIS-controlled city of Mosul. 
It's the third death of a U.S. service member in Iraq since the U.S.-led coalition launched its campaign against ISIS terrorists. Dr. Jim Carafano served as a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army, now retired and president or vice president of the Heritage Foundation's Foreign Policy National Security Institute. Jim, the White House calls this a combat death, but not a combat mission. Explain that distinction. Well, it's part of the administration really tying itself in knots, trying to sustain a narrative that it ended a war and it's not putting, as they say, boots on the ground. So there is a distinction between somebody who is in combat, which when we say that, we tend to mean that they're armed and they're actively going out and engaging an enemy. They're shooting at them and the enemy's shooting back at them. And there is a distinction between that and somebody who's in a combat area. In other words, he's in an area where there was fighting. So to say he wasn't engaged in combat, you know, it is kind of a distinction without a difference. It's true. But when you put an American serviceman in a combat zone, look, they're in combat. And in harm's way. Are we likely to lose more Americans as this goes on? So I get asked this question a lot. And I got asked a question is we're putting 250 additional troops in there. What does that mean? Does it make a difference? Are they at risk? And my answer, you know, being from a guy that spent 25 years in the military is, how the heck would I know? We don't know what their mission is. Uh, now we knew where this guy was operating, which is a very dangerous area, but they, they really didn't explain what the mission is, where they were operating, what they were doing. So it's very difficult for somebody sitting back here to do a risk assessment. But I, but I think the obvious answer is, if, if you're in, operating in Iraq, Syria, and you're operating with forces that are engaged with ISIS, that is a dangerous situation, and, and, and the potential for getting hurt or killed is pretty high. I appreciate your candor, though, on that question. Do you think the ceasefire can be salvaged in Syria? And is there any chance of a long-term peace? Well, I think as long as Iran and Moscow are backing Assad, Assad's not going anywhere. As long as Assad's not going anywhere, I think the conflict continues to boil on without resolution. Uh, they could sustain him, maybe not enough to drive all his enemies away, but certainly keep the conflict going. I mean, the most happy scenario is something that devolves into a cold peace, something that looked like what happened in Bosnia, was people just exhaust themselves and, uh, and, they, and they hold on to the territory that what they have. So it, it would, it'll be a, a peace through exhaustion, rather, I fear, than a peace through negotiation. We appreciate your expertise, Dr. Jim Carafano with the Heritage Foundation. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, the mega-hit musical Hamilton breaks a Broadway record with 16 Tony Award nominations. First time I'm thinking past tomorrow. Hamilton is nominated in virtually every category possible from acting to scenic design. The producers and Billy Elliot jointly held the previous record of 15 nominations each. This hip-hop story of the first U.S. Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton, already won this year's Pulitzer Prize for drama. Coming up, a Christian missionary imprisoned for two years in North Korea tells his story. And Leicester players are cheered after securing the team's first top flight title, and even the Vatican weighs in. Una momia, lì. Una momia spirituale. Pope Francis says many Christians are motionless, mummified, forgetting that Jesus is the only true path. He wants us to ask ourselves, how am I doing on the Christian journey? Thanks for joining us this Tuesday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. A Christian pastor credits his faith with getting him through the two years he spent in a North Korean prison. Kenneth Bay, held the longest of any American by North Korea since the Korean War, speaks out this week for the first time since his release. Wyatt Goolsby joins us with his story tonight. Brian, Kenneth Bay has some advice for the families of two Americans currently being held behind bars in North Korea. Now is the time to make some noise. He says it's thanks to others who voiced their concern for him that he was able to make it out. There was this moment of despair and losing hope um, and fatigue and also just physical hardship uh, I had to endure. Kenneth Bay says there's no shortage of stories from his time in a North Korean prison. From medical problems to intense feelings of isolation, Bay endured a lot of suffering. He was arrested by the North Koreans in 2012. He was leading a tour from China, a job he had for several years. But the authorities discovered what he was really doing by examining computer files in a hard drive. The whole purpose of bringing people into North Korea was to uh, pray uh, and in, in behalf of North Korean and uh, worship inside North Korea as a uh, as a Christian tourist coming in. Bay's missionary activities are against the law in the atheist state. He was sentenced to hard labor in prison where he read the Bible and watched TV. 
All the while, the pastor leaned on his faith. I'm a missionary, I'm a Christian. I was reminded that and there's a purpose, the reason why I'm, I was there. So I tried to keep a positive attitude. Bay was freed in 2014 after a secret mission organized by U.S. intelligence. He is not the only Christian missionary to get caught. Last week, another American was sentenced to 10 years for spying. North Korea regularly accuses Washington and Seoul of sending spies to overthrow its government. Bay says he prays for his captors and fellow inmates. Kenneth Bay hopes the biggest takeaway from his experience is God's faithfulness. He says while in prison, he had to de depend on prayer to keep himself motivated to live one day at a time. Brian. Thanks, Wyatt. And the head of the Congressional Planned Parenthood investigation demands full cooperation from STEM Express. That fetal tissue procurement company has yet to comply with subpoenas for a number of documents. Tennessee Representative Marsha Blackburn sent a letter today to STEM Express's CEO saying, we have yet to receive accounting, banking, and other business documents for which subpoenas were issued to STEM Express. Instead, we have received attorney-created estimates and summaries without backup materials. The committee is investigating charges Planned Parenthood profited from the sale of aborted baby parts. Most of the witnesses at a recent hearing agree the panel needs more records to determine the level of involvement of STEM Express. Jeannie Mancini, president of March for Life, is with us. What do you find most striking about this investigation, Jeannie? You know what's most striking is how widespread this problem is. I mean, Planned Parenthood has said again and again and again that this is not a widespread problem, that this is just, you know, one or two or three clinics. Well, what we're seeing in these documents from this hearing is that at least 100 abortion clinics were involved in this. I mean, I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. Do you think STEM Express is cooperating, and why is it so important that we get that cooperation in this investigation? Well, uh, I think what we're absolutely seeing is that abortion businesses are profiting off of these interactions. So what we're seeing is that STEM Express basically made this uh, to be a financially profitable thing and advertised it as such to abortion clinics. And they put in a full-time person into abortion clinics. They paid their salary. They paid, you know, benefits and everything so that any, any financial benefit that Planned Parenthood or other abortion clinics were receiving weren't going just to cover the cost of these transactions because that was totally covered. So what's obvious here is that the abortion clinics were making money. And why that is an issue is because it's illegal for anyone to profit off of the sale of fetal tissue. So the questions that are being raised seem very legitimate. Why is this panel meeting such opposition? You know, it's a great question, and I think it's because we're uncovering really seedy behavior here and potentially illegal behavior. The other side doesn't like that. Why do you think it's important that the investigation continue until we have a complete report? It's, well, it would be totally unethical as we're beginning to see more and more illegal behavior, potentially illegally behavior, illegal behavior, for the panel not to continue covering this. I mean, it's an absolute necessity, ethically speaking. Do you think we'll get to the bottom of the facts and will something happen as a result? We saw fact after fact after fact come out of this last committee, so I just really encourage that panel to continue despite the other side, you know, trying to make this into something that it's not. Jeannie Mancini with March for Life. It's always good to see you. Thank you. It's a you. pleasure. Thanks for having me, Brian. Well, 5,000 to 1. Those were the odds Leicester City beat to win England's Premier League soccer title for the first time. The team's coach, Italian native Claudio Ranieri, is hailed as a national hero. A newspaper headline calls him King Claudio. The Vatican weighs in comparing him to King Richard III. It says, while Richard was violent and eager for power, Ranieri is gentlemanly and restrained. Up next, the White House celebrates teachers on this National Teacher Appreciation Day. And today's Blue Mass precedes National Police Week here in D.C. Lovely lady dressed in blue, teach me how to pray. God was just your little boy, tell me what to say. A child's prayer to our Blessed Mother during Mary's month of May. Thanks for joining us on this Tuesday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. A one-time teenage mom who grew up surrounded by poverty and drugs earns this year's National Teacher of the Year Award. Connecticut's Johanna Hayes was awarded the honor at the White House this afternoon. The high school history teacher says Education was her path to success because her teachers challenged her. President Obama met with Hayes and hundreds of other educators from across the country. 
Hayes now spends a year on paid leave advocating for teachers across the nation. Dr. Thomas Burnford is interim president of the National Catholic Edu Education Association. What does Catholic education offer that public schools really can't? Catholic education, Brian, offers a formation in the Catholic faith. So we strive to form the whole student, the whole child, and prepare them not only for success in this life, but for success in the next life, to get them to heaven. And there are so many of us who have benefited from Catholic education. I wonder how much teachers bear a responsibility for catechesis in Catholic schools. Teachers bear a strong responsibility for catechesis, though we should acknowledge that parents are the primary educators of their children. So it works well when the parents and the teachers are working together. But catechesis is essential to the work of a Catholic school teacher, whatever subject they're teaching. This is, for example, why many schools have a STEM program, science, technology, education, math. At NCA, we're working with schools that have a stream program. We add an R for religion and an A for arts. And we include that throughout the curriculum to include catechesis and the teaching of the faith for every student in every subject. I love the connection between religion and art. Our Catholic Absolutely. faith really gives us both. So how would you advise parents uh, what would we, should we look for in a good teacher for our children? You know, I, I think uh, NCA is doing social media this week uh, about uh, students and some of the things we're hearing from teachers. We have a teacher who was asked why I teach and they said, because I love the children I teach. That's the sort of teacher you want. We had another teacher who said, I love nurturing and forming the dreams and hopes of children. These are committed teachers. What you want to look for in a school, firstly, is a strong Catholic identity, and then get to know the teacher for your child and see how that teacher is part of a broader community that loves your student and wants to form them in the faith. And can families who cannot afford a Catholic education still benefit from it? Absolutely. We know that Catholic schools are forced to charge tuition because of the way the taxing works in this country, um, but we also know there are tremendous amounts of scholarships available and opportunities and dioceses and the church make commitments to uh, low-income areas to support and help families to make schools as affordable as possible. I know our diocese does and we support that. Dr. Thomas Burnford, National Catholic Educational Association, thanks for being here on National Teacher Appreciation Day. Thank you so much, Brian. Well, finally tonight, we take you to St. Patrick's Church here in Washington. Today's Blue Mass honors first responders and remembers those who have died protecting us. May they rest in peace. So each year I try to make it down here to Blue Mass, uh, where the Archdiocese of Washington and the local area remembers all the fallen. Uh, today's Mass was uh, very powerful, very moving. Uh, it was touching and emotional. And it's a great sense of camaraderie to see all different agencies, all people can come together uh, under the house of God. And, 